to go in. Yeah. Hi right. everyone, uh, thanks for the invitation to take part in your Ed Talk today uh, and really appreciate the, the invitation to the school. It's my first time in the new school. I would have met a few of you when you were up in, um, in, in Mill Road, which was just around the corner from my own house. So I'm looking forward to getting a tour of your lovely new school um, later on. Uh, big thank you to Martha and Thomas for that really interesting, uh, those two really interesting presentations. And I might respond to a few of the things that you said in, in terms of what I say. So I'm, um, I'm a TD for the Green Party, so I represent the Dublin, fifth, the Dublin West constituency, and that's all of Dublin 15, a little bit of Dublin 7 as well. So in 2020, uh, there was a general election at the start of that year, just before COVID came in, uh, and I was elected by people uh, across Dublin 15 to be a, be, be a TD. I've been a councillor before, so I was part of Fingal County Council, and I've been a councillor since 2014. Once I became a TD, I had to give up my council role because I'm looking after national politics now, not local politics, and Pamela Conroy uh, took over my council seat and we work very closely together. Um, after an election, a new government has to be formed, so there was a long set of negotiations between the different political parties about creating a new government. And I was asked to be part of those for the Green Party. I was part of the Green Party negotiating team. And then at the end of June 2020, uh, Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and the Green Party agreed a programme for government, agreed these are the policies we'll follow over the next three to four years. Um, and then uh, as part of that, my party leader, Eamon Ryan, he asked me to become a minister in the government. Uh, and that was, um, it was a big change because in you know, January 2020, I was a lecturer over in DCU. That was my job. I taught law over there, a brilliant university over there. And then six, so I used to teach law, I used to teach about the constitution. And then six months later, I found myself actually in the government, uh, part of the, you know, the organization I used to teach people about. So it was a big change in, in quite a short period of time. But I was made minister for children, equality, disability, integration, and youth. So I might just briefly tell you about what my department covers, and then I'm going to maybe talk a bit more about it, the equality part of my work in a bit more detail because it's quite relevant to some of the points uh, Martin made earlier on. So as Minister for Children, I suppose I have three main jobs there. First of all, I'm in charge of all childcare in the country. So childcare, creches, Montessori's, I'm in charge of those. Uh, we've brought in some laws to make that cheaper for parents. We've brought in some laws to uh, increase the, the fees, the, increase the pay for uh, the people, and it's nearly all women who work in childcare services uh, all over the country. So uh, it's a good few years ago now, but I'm sure most of you would have been in a, a childcare or a creche or a, uh, a, a play school uh, in, in the area. So I'm in charge of them, and particularly in making sure there's enough of them uh, in the country, because we, particularly here in Dublin 15, we're, we're short on them, so we, we, we need to build more. Uh, I'm also uh, responsible for TUSLA, which is the Child and Family Agency, and TUSLA is an agency that involves if children or families are kind of in trouble, if there's conflict between parents, if parents aren't able maybe to fully look after their children. So TUSLA is an organisation that maybe has to step in uh, and take the place of parents sometimes, and maybe some kids might be fostered out from their, their original parents. So that's an important role, and, and I'm in charge of that. The other thing I'm in charge of, some of you may have heard of mother and baby homes. So these were places where back in Ireland's past, but not too long from about the 90s up to, to back until when Ireland was formed, um, it used when if a woman became pregnant and she wasn't married, that used to be judged as a very serious, I suppose kind of sin really. It was judged as, as uh, very shameful. And most women who became pregnant outside of marriage were sent to mother and baby homes. They'd have their baby, their baby would be adopted, and usually the mothers would never uh, see their children again. And it was all quite secretive, all quite shame-based, and it was a terrible way to treat women, to treat children. Um, so we recognised that that was the wrong thing to do now, and one of the jobs in my department is to try and uh, bring, bring redress, kind of make up for that, those terrible things that happened. So one of the things I've done, I've brought in a law that says if you were adopted, you have an automatic right to find out who your parents were, who your mother was. You have an automatic right to your original birth certificate. And that mightn't seem to be a big, you might think, well, automatically, of course you should have that. But for years in Ireland, we didn't give people the knowledge about who their family was if they were adopted, who their original birth family was. So we've changed the law and, and that's quite a big change we brought in. Um, and we're also uh, bringing compensation for people who are in these mother and baby homes. 
Um, so it's a difficult area. It's an area where you know a lot of people have have suffered over many years in Ireland. But it is important that we you know face up to the things we did wrong in the country back you know in in, in the decades gone past. So I'm Minister for Equality, and I might just park that one for a minute and come back to it later on. I'm Minister for Disability, so I'm in charge of all services for um, either children or adults with disabilities in the country. Uh, and one of the big things I'm looking at right now is making sure we can recruit more speech and language therapists, occupational therapists, psychologists to help children and young people who have particularly significant disabilities, whether they be on the autism spectrum, whether it's uh, intellectual disabilities, whether it's, uh, it's, it's, it's physical disabilities, to give them more help. We're also very focused on making sure that people with a disability can take place in, 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 uh, in, in, in normal life, uh, because I think for too long, disability was seen, that's a medical problem. People with a disability maybe were kind of pushed to the side of society. We want to make sure that everyone, irrespective of their disability, can take place and take part in society. One key way is to get employment. We have very low levels. A lot of people with a disability can't get work in Ireland, even though they might really want to. So we're working to really improve. We've got this uh, policy called the Comprehensive Employment Strategy, and that's all about making sure that people with a disability can take place in work. And if there are, you know, physical limitations in terms of their wheelchair can't get into their office that employers are supported to make it easier for people to actually take part in their in their in their workforce i'm minister for integration and as part of that job one of my big jobs is uh, looking after people who arrive in ireland fleeing war fleeing conflict elsewhere as i'm sure you're all very aware that's become a, a really big job in the last year because of the war in ukraine as you know in february of last year uh, Russia under Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine and millions of Ukrainians have had to flee their country because of the violence that's going on and about um, about 75,000 Ukrainians have come to Ireland uh, and my department is, in, is responsible for accommodating about 60,000 Ukrainians but there are wars going on in other parts of the world as well in Syria in Afghanistan in parts of uh, North and Central Africa uh, and people are fleeing to Ireland from other countries as well, and they're called international protection applicants. They're looking to be recognised as refugees here in Ireland. So there's about 20,000 people in Ireland seeking international protection. So I'm responsible in my department for accommodating about 80,000 people. And this, well, in, uh, let's say, uh, January 2021, sorry, January 22, before the war in Ukraine uh, broke out, we were responsible for accommodating about 7,500 people. So within 13 months, we've gone from looking after 7,500 people to 80,000 people. So it's been a huge jump and it's put pressure on our department, but we are by and large making sure everyone has self shelter, has safety, have uh, somewhere to stay, and particularly that young people can take place in school, primary school, secondary schools, uh, all, all over our country as well. Finally then, I'm a Minister for Youth. And as Minister for Youth, I'm in charge of um, making sure that youth services, so youth clubs all over the country are, are funded and can operate well. Some of you might be involved in Scouts, some of you might be involved in Foroiga or other, uh, so I suppose it's youth clubs, non-sporting related youth clubs is, is what my department is responsible for and uh, we're always looking to grow the amount of services that, uh, that we provide for young people. Another thing we do under the youth heading is youth participation, is ensuring that government is hearing the voices of young people and we help that helps in our decision making because obviously you guys aren't able to vote until you're uh, 18 and you know in previous years there was sense basically that young people didn't count until they had the vote, that basically their views weren't important until they crossed that magic threshold on their 18th birthday. But that's not right. Uh, all your views are really important as well. So my department has various mechanisms put in place so we can listen, we can gather the, the voices of young people. I don't know if any of you, would any of you be involved with Corla Minogue? I don't know if any of you know that organisation, you, 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 you'd be aware of it. So we run that and that allows the voices of young people be fed into government. And a really good example of that is uh, about two years ago, Corla Minogue came to me and said, we would like uh, young people who've left um, who've left school, so young people between the age of 19 and 23, young adults, to have free public transport, that they would be able to use public transport completely for free. 
uh, and they brought this idea to me. I brought it to the rest of government, particularly to the Minister for Transport, uh, and the Minister for Transport said, well, I don't have the money for it completely free, but I could give young adults 50% off their public transport for fees. So in all of you, when you turn 19, you'll now get a young adult travel card, and that will give you half price public transport up until you're 23. So that was an idea coming from young people, came to me, and we were able to bring that to government. The overall cost every year is about 46 million euro, so it's, an ex it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's worth a lot of money, but it will save young people now, young adults now, significant amount of money, and hopefully for, for yourselves in a, in a couple of years' time as well. That's just an example where an idea coming from young people got to government, and government actually acted and were, were able to, 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 to operate it. Um, a Minister for Equality, and there's a number of things that I look at in the, in the equality brief. Um, so obviously, uh, looking at equality based on, on race, uh, and as you know, Ireland is a very diverse country now, um, but unfortunately, we do see instances of, of racism take place. We've had racism in recent weeks towards people who are coming from Ukraine or in international protection. We probably saw some of those protests. But we've also had racism in Ireland long before that. We have had racism against the travelling community in Ireland for a very, very long time. Very deep racism in Ireland. So earlier this week, I launched a new national action plan against racism. So that's to set out how all parts of Ireland can tackle racism, can stop it, can prevent it, whether it's in schools, whether it's in state organisations or the Gardaí or how we decide on housing, uh, the allocation of housing. Nobody should uh, be put at a disadvantage because where they're from uh, or because of the, uh, the colour of their skin. Uh, and that's something I believe very strongly about. We haven't had a national action plan against racism in Ireland since 2008, so for a long time. Uh, so I'm delighted to have been able to launch that this week and I look forward to, to leading its implementation now over, over the next uh, number of years. I'm also in charge of LGBT plus equality, so making sure gay, uh, lesbian, bi or, 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 or trans people in Ireland don't face discrimination. And I head up the uh, LGBT plus um, uh, committee which, which looks after making sure all government departments are pursuing policies that, that, that make sure there's no uh, discrimination on the, on the grounds of sexual orientan uh, orientation or, uh, or, 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 or gender identity. But another key area in equality for my brief is gender equality and Marty you, you spoke very very powerfully earlier on about the issue of gender equality and you set out I suppose a number of the, 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 the key challenges um, and you know we as a country, I think, are getting better in terms of gender equality, but we, we have a significant way to go. And you referenced uh, that the, the, the gender pay gap, the fact that, by and large, across our country, women get paid 11% less than men, even if they're doing the exact same job, even if they're doing the exact same hours. And we can't, we don't, you know, it's hard to understand, well, why is that? Um, so we brought in a law last year called the Gender Pay Gap Information Act, so it means that every company, every employer, initially every employer with more than 250 employees every year has to report on the gap between what it pays its male and its female employees. And it has to say, what is the gap? They have to say, why is there a gap? And they also have to say, what are they doing about it? So initially it's for all employers above 250, so those would be big companies, but each year it's gonna drop down. So the second year it'll be for employers over 150 employees, and the third year it'll be for employers over 50 employees. So in the end it'll catch about 60, about two thirds of all people working in Ireland will be working in employers who have to make these returns. Uh, and we've had the first set of returns this, uh, this summer, uh, I was actually very proud in my department, we have a gender pay gap in favour of women. So actually more women, women are getting, in general, in average, are being better paid than men in my department. But generally, it does show big issues with a gender pay gap uh, across the country. So that's an important step to, to, to address a really important issue. You also referenced domestic violence, domestic sexual and gender-based violence, DSGBV. And that's something this government, when we started, when we negotiated the program for government uh, in, in, uh, in early 2020, we all made a commitment that violence against women in particular has to stop in our country. Whether it's women getting you know, shouted at or wolf whistles at in the street, or uh, somebody in their home being abused by, by a husband or a partner. So we took a, a whole load of steps. The first big step was the third uh, national strategy on DSGBV. 
Uh, so that's setting out how all of government will work for a zero tolerance approach that violence against women should never be tolerated in any setting. And that's what government policy is and we're taking various measures to actually address that. Second key point is we're creating an agency, an organisation, part of government, dedicated solely to ending violence against women. So this is a really big step and those organisations who've been working in this area for a long time have been asking for this for a long time. So we've gone ahead and done that and that's something that, that, that I'm really proud, proud to have been involved in. And the third thing, and, and this is done directly within my department, we're allowing people, women or men, who are victims of domestic violence to take paid leave from work to if they need to, if they need to be hospitalised, unfortunately, if they need to speak to their lawyer, if they need to move house, any issues that has come about because they are the victims of, of abuse, they can take five paid leave, paid days leave from work. So again, a, a, another important step in terms of supporting people who are victims of, uh, of domestic, uh, domestic violence. The third area that we're working on now is we are changing our constitution to make it more uh, equality friendly. So our constitution is the basic document of this state. It was agreed in 1937 when, when Ireland was, uh, you know, I suppose breaking free finally from the United Kingdom and establishing ourselves as an independent country. It's a really good document, but every so often you have to change it. And as you probably know, the only way we can change our constitution is a referendum. Everyone in the country votes. Do we make this change? Yes or no? And we've had big referendums in Ireland over the last few years. In 2018, we voted to change the constitution to allow abortion. Uh, and in 2015, we changed the constitution to allow marriage equality, to allow same-sex couples to actually get, get, uh, get married. We have a line in our constitution that says, woman by her place in the home provides a service without which the state can, can, cannot do without. So our constitution actually says women have their place in the home. And that might have been okay in 1937, but certainly I don't think anyone believes that's the case today. So one of the things I'll be working on over the next few months is a referendum to actually change that line, to take it out and probably say something like, recognize that care in the home or outside of the homes is important and it's provided by everyone. It's provided by mams, it's provided by dads, it's provided by aunts and uncles. Um, so care is really important and we shouldn't forget that. But this idea that women's place is in the home, it's, it's just, I think most people recognize it's just not acceptable anymore. Now changing the constitution, it's, it's not going to change everyone, anyone's life, I'll be honest with you, but the constitution is a kind of a basic statement of what we are about as a country. Uh, and I think it's really important that kind of an outdated notion that women's places in the home just can't be there anymore. So we're hoping to hold a referendum probably in November of this year and, uh, and, and, make, that, uh, and, and make that particular change. So those are the, some of the key things that I'm doing as, as, uh, as, as Equality Minister. Do I have a minute or two more, or do you want me to, to wrap up? Yeah, no, it's, it's a lot of points, and I hope there's still another 15 minutes. Grant, another couple of minutes, yeah. Just, I suppose, the other thing, and just responding to some of the points that, that Thomas made, I'm a, I'm a, as you see from my department, I don't touch anything to do with the environment. I'm doing mainly with social issues, but I'm also a TD for the Green Party, and the reason I joined the Green Party, the reason there is a Green Party, is because we believe that environmental issues have to be important in Irish politics. Um, they're not the only issue, and I know there's big issues. There's issues about housing and homelessness. There's issues to do with the war in Ukraine. Uh, but environmental issues have to be important. And as Green Party TDs, we always see it's really important that the issues that you were talking about, Thomas, are debated and we're looking to bring solutions to climate change. We're looking to bring solutions to the damage to, to nature in our country. So I was just really interested in your focus on reduce, reuse, recycle, and just in terms of a couple of things we're doing. We're, we, my colleague Eamon Ryan, who's the, the Minister for the Environment, he's brought forward a Circular Economy Act. And this is basically a law that says we have to get better at everything we make, we should, it should be recyclable, it should be, it, we can break it down, we shouldn't allow it to be repaired. And just looking around like, you know, you, you've all got your, um, your uh, reusable bottles. If I'd been in a school maybe seven years ago, all of you would have had plastic bottles. So we are making changes and it's really, it's so important. I know a lot of schools push these things, but they are so much better than the kind of plastic throwaway bottles that, that would have been uh, in, in use not so long ago. But we're building special laws to make it easier 
for materials to be reused for goods and, and uh, goods to be uh, to, to be recycled and, and even in terms of reduction as well so we're bringing in a tax on coffee cups we're calling it the the, uh, the latte levy so when you buy a coffee in a coffee shop if you're not bringing your own cup if you're using one of the coffee cup uh, coffee shop cups you'll have to pay an extra 25 cents on top of your coffee um, so that again is about getting people to reduce the amount they use and actually bring their own coffee cups. It's funny, just before COVID, everyone was really starting to use coffee cups and then during COVID, obviously there were issues there, but we're hoping to bring that, that, that back again. Similarly, for plastic bottles like normal, you know, water valley gown or Coke or, 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 or 7up bottles, we'll be putting a tax on them. Uh, that's called a deposit and return. You'll pay an extra 10 cents when you buy a bottle, but if you give, bring it back to the shop, you'll get 10 cents back. So the idea is, you know, you all see when you're out walking about, so many of these are dumped, but if we get people into the habit of bringing them back, again, that's whole idea of reduce, reuse, recycle, and just building that into kind of people's habits um, and, and, and things like that are, are so important. And I suppose just to follow up, to kind of conclude, um, restoring nature is so important because a lot of damage has been done to our planet. It's been done here in Ireland, but it's been done all over the world as well. One of the key things the Green Party and government are trying to do is make sure we can restore nature. So this week is National Tree Planting Week. So I've been doing kind of tree plantings all over in, in, uh, in, in schools and in community groups around Dublin 15. And just something simple like planting some trees, like leaving an area maybe in your school wild where um, you're not kind of looking to make it into a, a, a perfect flower bed or anything like that, but where wild, uh, wild plants can, can, can grow, maybe some animals can, can, can live there. Those things are really important because um, as Dublin has grown, we've kind of built up and you know, all the kind of natural areas have disappeared, a lot of them have disappeared. And it's really important that even at a small scale, if you're looking to make some wild areas in your school or in your home, that is actually so good for, we call it biodiversity, we've all these big fancy titles for things, but really it's about nature. It's about making sure there's more nature in all our areas. So that's not my job in government, but it is one of the key things the Green Party are trying to, uh, are trying to achieve in government and very much, uh, I suppose, a response to some of the things Thomas you were saying. So folks, look, I hope that maybe gives you a slight idea about some of the work that I do uh, in my department. But I don't know if any of you have any questions about about that, or indeed anything else. Uh, happy to happy to answer them. Martha, hi. So sorry, I just want to say something. Yes. Um, so in regards to the pay gap, mm -hmm. do you think that by making the businesses state like if they have it in favor of men, do you think that like by making them stated that they will try to work to make it equal, or are you going to do something about the companies that make that are in favor mm -hmm. of men for the pay gap? Yeah. This is a, they have to give the information and they have to say why they believe it and they have to say what they're doing about it. Uh, and I think to start, and we'll do, operate this for a few years and see how does that go. Because everyone knew about this, but no one really had very clear figures. So we're forcing all of these employers to be much clearer about it and set out exactly what they're doing. But the other thing is like, in a couple of years time, you'll be looking for a job and if you see, let's say you get into the tech set sector and you see Google and you see Facebook and Facebook has a clear gender pay gap in favor of men and Google pay men, male and female employees about the same, you're gonna to go to the company where you know you're gonna be treated well and all the other women in the sector will as well. So that's gonna be really bad for the company who has a clear gender pay gap. So they're gonna start, you know, employees will start moving with their feet uh, and companies that have a clear gender pay gap where they're not doing anything about it are going to suffer. Yeah. So, I, and I think that might actually, rather than government acting, I think that will probably have the biggest change in impact. Hi. Um, you said you were the minister of, was it refugees yeah. in the country? Um, what's your opinion on direct vision? And it, like, it's kind of, the government have said it'll be getting rid of by 2024. Mm. What's your opinion on that? So it was I who said that, and, and I said that in at the start of 2021, um, and that was a time when we had about, as I say, seven and a half thousand people in uh, in the direct provision system. Uh, that's now 20,000 people. So I had hoped to be able to end direct provision by the end of 2024. I think it's very unlikely that we're going to meet that date because just 
we, we had a very detailed plan set out as to how we, this document called the white paper on ending the rent provision. It was very detailed, it was setting out how we were going to do it, how we were going to speed up, get people's applications for international protection processed more quickly and allow them a decision. But then we've seen this huge increase in migration from Ukraine and from other countries since the, I suppose, the, 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 the beginning of 2022. So I just, you know, I always try and be as honest with people as possible. It's really unlikely we'll get it ended by, 2020, by the end of 2024. And we're actually struggling right now to get even basic accommodation for refugees because of that increase. And we're not alone, it's important to say, every European country is struggling. I don't know if any of you ever watch BBC News, but the UK are having large numbers of refugees arrive. They're taking a different approach, I would think a more hostile, a more negative approach to refugees than we are. And I, I, I don't agree with that, but look, there are, there are different countries, so they're, they're gonna do what they're gonna do. Um, but we want to end direct provision, but I think I want to start that process, but I think it uh, will hopefully be the next government who finally ends it. And look, that's disappointing for me because I had a real ambition to do, to end that. It was one of the key things I wanted to do in this department, but I also have to be realistic. The ground has completely changed. The numbers have completely changed. And look, sometimes when everything changes, you have to change your plans accordingly. Do you have any advice for anyone who would think to look into going into politics in the middle? I would say do it. Um, I like I've been involved in politics like since I was very young, probably probably about some of you, your own ages, uh, and it's been a very rewarding uh, experience from from for me. And obviously, some people do it as their job. I, I've been doing it as my job for a long time now. Other people are just involved as volunteers, and that's you know that's so important as well and so beneficial for uh, for political parties. I think you know political parties are always looking for young people to get get involved. Kind of the the age group, the age range of people involved in politics keeps getting older and older uh, and that's that's not great we need young people involved certainly it's, it's not always easy and certainly you know social media a lot of stuff gets put out in social media now that maybe when i started wasn't there and that kind of makes it hard sometimes but look it's a it's a really uh, it's, it's very rewarding and, and the ability to kind of make changes whether it's in your kind of own immediate community like like pamela is doing in terms of her work on the council or you know across the country um or even I, I got the opportunity two weeks ago, I was at uh, New York on, at the, in the United Nations and they're doing their annual meeting about gender issues, which is the Commission for the Status of Women. Uh, and I got to address the United Nations Security Council. So that was, that was very exciting to be honest, but uh, um, it is, you know, it is a, a, an amazing uh, a, opportunity. But um, uh, so yeah, I would say get involved, find a political party where the things they're talking about mean something to you and you know, ask to get involved and uh, you know, most will snap, snap you up and, and if they don't, that's kind of, that's their loss to be, to be honest. Any other, uh, any other questions guys? Okay, listen, that's great. Thank you very much for your attention.